Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be discussing a new letter put out by the ATF discussing which people may not purchase firearms. We'll also be talking about unmanned drones that have the potential to track you based on your biometric information, plus immigration news out of Alabama, and a whole lot more coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. Thank you very much for tuning in to episode 224 or season 6, episode 36 of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. We've got a lot to get into, Nick. We are going to be getting into just who the ATF thinks should not own firearms here in the United States, as well as a, a couple other stories about drones and, and the Alabama uh, law that pretty much... Well, it's, it seems a little bit, it's anti-immigrant. I'm sure people have um, definitely heard this. It's national news. Some of the other stories we're going to be talking about been brushed under the carpet by the mainstream media, so we're going to talk about them. But I think it's important to weigh in on some of the bigger issues as well because they certainly do affect a lot of people, uh, especially people trying to get an educational. So we'll be getting into that. But first, I wanted to talk about something that's close to home, at least close to where uh, um, a lot of people watch us in Massachusetts. We're on a number of uh, stations in Massachusetts, and it's right to the south of where we're broadcasting from here in Key, New Hampshire. But similar things are happening all over the country. So just if you're in Massachusetts, this really affects you, but it also affects other people because, well, courts are running out of money, states are running out of money, and so who do they pass the, the fees on to? Well, you, those who have to go to court oftentimes. I know that they just changed the rules here in New Hampshire about uh, fighting speeding tickets and what have you, and in Massachusetts, they've taken things a step further, essentially saying that even if you are innocent, found innocent by the court of whatever moving violation or vehicle violation you were cited for, you still may have to pay a fine. Well, actually, you definitely still have to pay fees. It's not a fine. It's just a fee for fighting and um, having the court rule that you're innocent. And the Massachusetts Supreme Court has ruled on this. Um, and what they have said is innocent drivers can be charged $75 to fight a traffic ticket. Motorists issued traffic tickets in Massachusetts will have to pay money to the state whether or not they committed the crime, or I guess it would be called a violation. According to the state Supreme Court, a ruling hand handed down just last week, fees can be imposed even to those found completely innocent by a judge. The high court saw no injustice in collecting $70 from Ralph C. Sullivan, an attorney, after he successfully fought a $100 ticket for failure to stay within the marked line. Bay State drivers given speeding tickets and other moving violations have 20 days to either pay up or submit a non-refundable $20 payment to a special clerk magistrate. After that tri uh, trial, they have to go see the clerk magistrate. After that, they can further challenge the district court judge by paying a $50 non-refundable payment. And apparently, if you're found not guilty, you get to go away, but you don't get those payments back. You don't have to pay the the speeding ticket fine, you just still don't get your fees back, even if you are 100% innocent. See, I always found it a little bit angersome that if you spent the day going to court, fought, and were found innocent, that you didn't get anything back for all that time wasted. Now, not only do you not get anything back for that time wasted, but you also have to pay to waste your time. Um, last year, it looks like the state of Massachusetts got uh, $3,678,620 in these such fines. So this is something that adds up to a sizable amount of money. And it looks like Sullivan, an attorney, is not planning to further appeal this to the U.S. Supreme Court. He says, quote, while the de decision did not go my way, I am safe in the knowledge that I gave it my best shot. Sullivan said, I took this on this case because I felt that it was the right thing to do. And I'd agree. I don't know if it would make me very happy to just say I gave it my best shot in the state one. But kudos to him for at least taking the time to do it. Yeah. Not so much to the Unfortunately, state. Unfortunately, at this point, what it means is if you're, if you're issued a traffic ticket, then essentially you're going to lose regardless of how the, you know, mm -hmm. how the case pans Essentially, out. it has to be over $70 for you to either take it to trial no matter what because if it's less than say you get a fifty dollar moving violation you ticket well you're going to be paying more if you, if you win than if you just paid the ticket 
Right. It's kind of depressing. So you really don't get to contest yeah. like a fifty dollar ticket. And this is nothing new. They've been doing this as I read. They've well, collected it's not just old Massachusetts either. No, I mean, this happens. In other this happens states. all the, all around the, the the country. I know Massachusetts for a long time has been making you go to two different trials if you want to fight a ticket. You essentially have to go to this magistrate, this clerk magistrate, and say yes, I want to fight this, and he goes, okay, well here's a. Uh, another trial so you already have to go to two trials and miss two days now you have to pay for those I guess is the difference they've been doing that for a little while here in New Hampshire they just started doing what Massachusetts used to only do and make you go to two different trials uh, if you want to fight a speeding ticket so it's it's not just in Massachusetts this is all over the country as bud state budgets tighten up well the, those costs that they're not collecting in taxes from you they are going to collect some way else because right. well and they want to make it as difficult as possible for you to actually get yeah you know, for it to make sense for you to get process um because they don't want you to fight a ticket they don't really want you to have recourse to due process when it comes to traffic tickets because they just want to bring in the money which i think is uh, a little bit wrong well, whenever I'm th <laughs> you think about laws like this i think of incentives and where what are people incentivized to do now people are no longer incentivized to fight the ticket which is very very good if you are the state of massachusetts or any state collecting money from people what, what's more bothersome about it than me about than fighting the tickets are what are the police officers now incentivized to do because now if they write tickets they know essentially that people aren't going to be fighting them if they're less than $70. There's pretty much no chance people are going to be fighting them. Suppose there's a few people out there that just want to be found not guilty if they didn't do something. But for the most part, even if people were completely violated the law, they're going to be paying these speeding tickets or other moving violation tickets, uh, anything under $70, it seems. So it seems the incentive for the police is now a little bit backwards, too. And I know not all police are bad people out there, but incentives... They're very important. If free economics has taught me nothing, it's that incentives are important. Yeah, incentives are incentives really control the way people behave. Um, and yeah, if if you can write the tickets basically with impunity to where it just makes sense for people to plead out, then you might write a whole lot more tickets. You might write tickets that uh, you wouldn't otherwise be able. You didn't actually right. gun somebody going over the speed limit or whatever it was. You didn't really see them not wearing their seatbelt. Whatever it was you might as well issue the ticket because it only makes sense for them to pay whether and it they makes did you look it or good. not. I mean, uh, a lot of police departments, they're, they're, the chief is saying, well, you got to write uh, 100 tickets this week. That's, that's what everybody, go do it. So it makes you look good if you write more tickets. And well, why not write a few tickets if maybe it's a gray area in the law? Maybe it, things aren't as black and white anymore. It doesn't really matter. So the incentives, just think about incentives and... That's what's troubling to me. But anyways, there are other things that we need to be getting into and talk about. Um, the federal government, mm -hmm. they have a lot of laws on who can own guns and what kind of guns there are. Right. Despite a very clear law that they're supposed to abide by, which is the Second Amendment. Right. But well, they, they typically don't. There's, th there's one law saying it's the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and then there's well over 20,000 other laws saying that they well, can't. Well, to call them laws is, is, is a little bit generous, too, because a lot of the, the rules that the ATF enforces are actually not, um, they're not pieces of legislation. They're not statutory law. Rules. It's right. It's, it's, it's rules that are changed sometimes fairly frequently. Rules you can go to jail for. So right. they're, they're not laws, but they are rules that if you break them, you face... You might go to federal prison for right. a few years. Right. And they, you know, they sort of change I'm gonna the rules go back ahead and, and forth. So it's, whether you want to call it a law or a rule, it's stuff that people can come and lock you in a cage for. So. Right. But it's not like you voted for anybody who comes up with these rules. They just come up with them. Um, but they send out a new letter to firearms dealers in the state of Montana um, telling basically any any firearms dealer anybody who has a uh, who is a federal firearm licensee um, that they cannot uh, sell weapons to people who answered yes to the question on the form when you buy a gun that asks if you are a user of a controlled substance even if the reason they're answering yes is because they're a medical marijuana patient consistent with state law in Montana so what they're saying here is, yeah, even if you're just following state law and you're using a, basically a prescription medicine, according to the state of Montana, 
the ATF says it's illegal for gun shops or, or licensees who can sell guns to actually make that sale, which strikes me as a little bit odd, Toby, because they don't enforce it this way. This is a controlled substance. So they don't, they don't enforce this against people who are taking prescription medication. Well, they don't enforce it this way against people who drink alcohol. That's because it's, gun it's, it's having to do with federal law and the exact language you use. A, a prescription or prescribed substance is something that's federal. That's states can't prescribe you a medical marijuana. They can have a doctor's recommendation. So it's not a prescribed drug, even if it is recommended by your doctor that you use it because doctors can't prescribe something if it's against the law on the federal level. And so that's why you can go out and get all hooked on some other horrible substance like opiates or, or alcohol or any of the other myriads, thousands of prescription drugs out there. And well, then you can own a firearm, but not if you are recommended to use right. medicine by your doctor on the state level. Right. And I certainly wouldn't recommend that people uh, shoot while they're using marijuana or really any other drug nope. out there. But uh, yeah, to, to say that a blanket well, statement, just somebody who's a medical marijuana patient right. can't use, can't own firearms, it's a pretty blanket. Except Drunks are what I'd worry about most, Nick. A drunk and a firearm, they don't mix very well. I mean, really, drunks in anything. Well, that's, I think they, uh, I think dangerous. they mix very well, just not from a safety perspective, right? I mean, oh, I guess it's fun for the I, drunks. I, I suppose it is. I mean, I suppose there seems to be a lot of overlap there. Yes, not drunk. say I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Well, you're talking system. about accidents and uh, well, yeah, gun-related I mean, accidents, car-related accidents. Uh, yeah, really, they're drunk, in so they'll probably survive it, right? The, well, the the drunk might, or may, maybe not. It's it's other people that I'm also very worried about here, Nick. Is uh, all the people around the drunks, maybe? I suppose it's the other drivers on the concern. road, the the people who might get shot by the drunk. I suppose it's a legitimate concern. I don't know. I have, I'm sure that there's also people who have accidents using other prescription drugs, yeah, marijuana I mean, too. But I think that when you're you're talking about danger level here. Very much I, I like think drunk driving. I think where people quite often get injured when they're mixing either alcohol or prescription drugs. I mean, certainly you don't want to mix them with firearms or with driving, especially. That's an obvious one. But a lot of times if you're on certain prescription medications, you might as well just be drinking all day every day in terms of the effect it has on your motor skills and things like that. So um, I think a lot of people actually overlook the real danger areas. Well, and it's, it's not just by a doctor, it's right? It's using safe. power tools or you know, they do have warnings doing. on them, but well, it's true. Yeah, I mean they've got warnings on them. That's great, but I mean, yeah, a lot of the prescription medications out there are probably um, probably have just as much potential to to make you more prone to accidents as as marijuana or alcohol. Yeah, I would I would definitely recommend that if you are going to use firearms, of course, take yeah. the the safety courses and get to know them and respect them and, yeah, and don't, don't do use them high. if you're on any substance whatsoever. Yeah. It's just a really poor idea. Very poor idea. Anyways, but it is interesting though that the ATF is going after people. It well, makes it's me wonder it's a federal agency, right? So they're regulating the firearms on mm -hmm. this is, you know, according to the federal bureaucracy in charge of uh, regulating firearms. These people aren't allowed to possess firearms under federal law. It's, it's, you know, it's just like with the DA saying that uh, marijuana is a Schedule One drug. The states have looked the other way on that, so there's a chance that the states might just look the other way on their enforcement of this provision, too. But the, the gun shops and the licensees really have to worry because they deal directly with the ATF. If you're running a gun shop, you're dealing directly with the ATF. So there's no way for the licensees here to get around that, well, it's even if the state's not cracking down. What's interesting to me is going back to incentives. It seems like it's an incentive that the federal government is incentivizing people not to use uh, marijuana if it's been prescribed by their doctor, because if they do, then they can't own firearms, unless they lie about it when they go to apply for their license, I guess, or to buy a gun, right? Right, well, I mean, that's the thing here, is there's just the question of whether people are gonna accurately fill out the forms. Uh, because you're, what you're doing when you fill out the paperwork to buy a, the ATF required paperwork to f purchase a firearm is you're basically self-reporting on a number of things. Now, my understanding is it's a violation of federal law to lie on the form. I'm pretty sure it but, is. Um, the question is, in reality, are people who are medical marijuana patients going to voluntarily self-report and check the box that says, yes, I'm a user of a controlled substance? If they really want to get a gun, probably not. Interesting. Anyways. So I don't, I don't know what effect this is actually going to have on medical marijuana users purchasing firearms it's in just, the real world. It's but. just interesting to...
think about the incentives. So, uh, well, another incentive that the federal government is imposing, not the federal government, I'm sorry, the state government in Alabama is imposing on, way, well, I guess this would be their non-citizens, or at least the Hispanic community, mostly, I guess all immigrants in general, but let's be honest here, they're going after mostly Hispanic people, people south of the United States border. Um, it's been national news that the um, this law is essentially, it makes it pretty tough if you are an immigrant, especially an undocumented immigrant in, era, um, in Alabama. And this is coming from Fox News, actually. Hispanic students have started vanishing from Alabama public schools in wake of a court ruling that upheld the state's t uh, new tough law cracking down on illegal immigration. Education officials say scores of immigrant families have withdrawn their children from classes or kept them home this week, afraid that sending their kids to school would draw attention from authorities. Uh, the new law, or I guess the upheld law, requires schools to check students' immigration status. Local and state officials are pleading with immigrant families to keep their children enrolled. The law does not ban anyone from school, they say, and uh, neither students nor parents will be arrested for trying to educate their children. But many Spanish-speaking families aren't waiting around to see what happens. The law does not, uh, does not require proof of citizenship to enroll and it does not apply to students who were enrolled before September 1st. While most students are not affected, school systems are supposed to begin checking the status of first-time enrollees. The state has distributed to schools sample letters that can be sent home to parents of new students informing them that the law's requirements uh, require citizen documents or a sworn statement from the parents. In an attempt to ease suspicions that the law may lead to arrest, the letter tells parents um, parents that immigration information will only be used for to gather statistics. Quote, rest assured, the letter states that uh, it will not be a problem if you are unable or unwilling to provide either of the documents. But another big problem here is these letters are written in English, and a lot of the parents of immigrant uh, children, especially illegal immigrant children, they don't speak English, so it's not really working to keep kids enrolled in school. And you know what, Nick? If I was one of the parents of these of, of a Hispanic child who did not have the proc proper documentation in Alabama, I probably wouldn't, would be a little bit nervous to send my kid to school as well. Yeah, and you know, the, the bigger issue here with the new immigration laws in Alabama where basically they're uh, going to be asking for documentation from anybody who's suspicious is, well, basically that means anybody who's a member of the Hispanic community who has an accent or, I mean, it, how do you determine that somebody's suspicious in terms of their immigration status? It, pretty much you're going to just try to ask all the Hispanic people for their si proof of citizenship, right? Papers, so, please. Right. So, um, in, you know, blunt, that in real terms, that's what it amounts to. Okay, but... So, basically, you're just saying, if you're Hispanic-looking or you're funny-talking, then we're just going to check your paper. Right. You know, what's, what's so troubling about this, Nick, is it seems like, in, with all the troubles in the economy, illegal immigrants. It seems weird to me that a, a human being can be illegal, but I like to call them undocumented immigrants. Um, how, how they, some people really think that they are the blight on America. I listen to, for example, Howie Carr <clears throat> on the radio sometimes. And man, he Is does not... clearing like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, he's on the radio and sometimes I'm interested with, with what he talks to us. So I it's turn a it there funny, for a few it's minutes. It's an entertaining show, I'll give it that. Sometimes. He doesn't quit, though. It is nonstop oh. hating on undocumented workers. Yeah. It's, it's just ridiculous. And the callers who call in, Nick... They really do believe that 90% of the problems in the United States, the unemployment, these wars that are going on abroad, it is crazy how many people really believe that it is undocumented workers that are the sole cause of all of America's problems. And if we only elected a candidate to, presidents, uh, to the uh, presidential office who would really tackle this problem and get rid of the 12 million or so undocumented uh, citizens here in the United States, that all the problems would go away and America would be prosperous again, or I guess the United States, because Mexico no longer would be, right? Because they'd have all those undocumented workers back. It would be horrible for them. 
You know, it, it is amazing to me how many people really truly believe that scapegoating undocumented immigrants is the way to solve America's problems. And then to make them scared to go to school, like is happening here in Alabama, to make them not get an education is somehow going to make problems better. Yes, I guess in reality some will go to other states. But what happens, Nick, when you don't educate a population? Now, the argument from the people who don't like the undocumented workers is that all they do is commit crime. They rob from people, they deal drugs, they operate only in the black market. Uh, they're shady folk, right? That's the argument well, that's, that I hear. That's the, uh, yeah, what that's happens the argument. when you don't educate people? Uh, typically, they, they tend to have much higher rates of criminality hmm. and contribute far less to society. So people who, aren't, who don't know how to read and write, they don't get jobs and work in the, in the open market where... Usually they, you know, they sell math or something, or, oh. or they run numbers. Or, so I guess you know, making immigrants afraid to go to school is going to solve right. our well, crime problem. We don't actually want, we don't actually want to, you know, immerse immigrant children and actually you know, assimilate them into because that's what used to happen. But I guess the answer here is just let's just not assimilate the immigrants. We'll just uh, what you're actually looking at is to some extent laws like this can promote. Um, the existence of basically an underclass of immigrants where... Well, we've already they, had an underclass of immigrants, right. Nick. That's the illegal immigrants are the underclass of immigrants already. Now what you've, you're doing is making them afraid to get an education and actually, as you said, assimilate. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's very troubling to me. Yeah. It uh, seems bigoted and racist. I think that's, well, I, that's I'm pretty sure much right out there. Well, I'm sure it's going to be. Because, uh, uh, how can uh, it not? Unless they just randomly ask people, but frankly, I think I could walk down the street in Alabama under the provisions of the new law, as it stands right now, and there are going to be challenges in the, in the courts, but uh, under the provisions of the new law, as it stands right now, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be questioned. If a police officer tries to stop me and ask for my papers after yeah. a couple of words get out of my mouth, he's going to know I'm not from Alabama, mostly, actually a lot of Places in Alabama don't have a terribly thick accent, but um, he's probably going to know I'm not from Alabama, but he's going to assume I'm probably from inside the U.S. Actually, or Canada, and illegal Canadian immigrants don't count, and let's, which is interesting, by the way, because if you look at how many people are in Canada who come down here without the documentation or they overstay their visa-free travel and things like that, it's a lot of illegal Canadians in the U.S. Well, Nobody cares about illegal Let's Canadians. face it, Nick. Chances are you're not going to be talked to by the police officer if you're walking down the street, right? <laughs> No. They, they're not going to profile you, but profiling doesn't go on, don't worry. Um, well, actually, when I t listen to people like Howie Carr, they're, they're outraged that profiling doesn't go on, even though it, it does. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. I had one more thing to say, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, you're, either, there's, you're either outraged with what we're saying and you're throwing stuff at the TV, or you agree with us that this is just bigoted and racist. Um, so I'm not going to win you over if you're someone who agrees with the Howie Cars of the world and thinks that we should round up all the illegals and deport them or put them in a well, jail cell. I can understand why people living in areas where there's very high rates of illegal immigration, uh, I can understand why they have a problem with it. I can understand why they dislike it because, sure. you know, as it exists today, it, it does put a burden on, on a lot of communities. Um, I think to some extent it's just, you know, immigrants are kind of scary and different there, there's there's that at play. Um, there's always been that that tension when new immigrant groups are coming in because they speak a different language and they eat different kinds of food. It happened with like the, that. the Italians and the mm -hmm. Irish and every pretty much everybody. But uh, as they came in, but um, you know, I understand that there are ill effects to to this immigration occurring the way it occurs today. Yep. I think you'd be a lot better off creating a system where people can actually come here and work if they want to than trying to just what just close the borders and nobody gets in that immigration thing that they, we used to do we they don't took do our it anymore. jobs right i mean if you if you allowed people to come and work not necessarily to become u.s citizens but if you allowed people to come in and work without i mean right now we've got a quota system in place for countries like mexico i mean a lot of people out there say well why don't they just come in legally you do understand that if you you're a mexican who's trying to provide for your family, it's not like you just have to fill out a form and then you're legal, right? You fill out a form, pay a bunch of money that you probably don't have because you're a Mexican 
trying to make money to provide for your family. You can't do that in Mexico. Hence, why you'd want to come to the U.S. And you, you have to wait at the back of a line for years. There are, there are many times more people who are taking part in the legal immigration process from Mexico than there are spots open, quota spots open in our immigration system. Meanwhile, you're supposed to wait while a whole bunch more people just jump over a fence, quite literally. All they have to do is walk up to this fence, jump over it, and keep trucking for a few more miles until they hit a highway or something. I, I don't know why people expect Mexicans and other people not to come. Well, well they're violating U.S. law. They don't care. They like to eat. Hmm. They like to have, you know, a, you know, clothes and things like that. Sleeping on a dirt floor. But Nick, how can the Howie cars of the world? Now. How can a Howie Car? And I'm sorry if you don't know who he is. He's a he's a bigoted right wing <laughs> news uh, uh, talk radio show host. Uh, uh, how can they work at the poultry farms and on the fr and pick fruit if if the Im immigrants are here? Anyways, I do have a plan. The, maybe the federal government can help us. They can use maybe their their new spy drones to, to detect who the immigrants are and pick them up. Oh, yeah. That well, was a they're sweet trying, transition. They're, they're working on this <laughs> <laughs> pretty hard and fast, actually. But, um, <laughs> yeah, apparently, currently the U.S. military is working on um, putting facial recognition technology into drones. Now, this is something that exists currently. That both technologies exist just separately. No one's been able to package them together in a way that really works all that well. We do have facial recognition um, software that can be you know, linked together with, uh, with cameras, and, and they've already you know, done testing of this at major public events. They set these things up at the, uh, at the Olympics, I believe, other major sports events to look for terrorists who are showing up to blow things up. You know, it scans everybody's face and sees if they're a match for the terrorists. They might also make a little match for your face and make a little file for you. Doesn't that make you feel so much better? Um, <laughs> I feel better already, Nick. <laughs> but uh, I just, people are just stupid. I mean, I'm sorry, but I, you know, I've Keen State started going there. Don't live there. Don't have a meal plan. You know the new way that you get your meat. You pay for your meal. You scan your hand. Well, it's only takes. Does that size. not seem insane to you? You, you they're taking a. No, it's electronic a, reading of your hand. It's you only just the show size. The it's the anymore. size of your hand. It's not a scan. It's the size of your fingertips or something. It's still a unique identifier, like a finger. I've been Dick, told it's more accurate than we're a fingerprint. Out of, That's not insane to people. Oh, let's get our hand scan. It's amazing. Just use your ID. It's amazingly cool. It's also amazingly It's scary cool. Yeah, a lot it. of this new stuff. This is so wicked cool. So cool. The fact that they can fly this airplane, this that is also unmanned how the airplane, kill us all. go by somewhere and be like out of the crowd. That's the guy we want. And then I bet they can blow him up right there. Pretty yeah. cool technology. Anyways, out of time, freemindstv.com. In the meantime, until next week, it's been Toby here with you. And Nick. Have a good night.